dogs, ants, birds. And, and humans are animals, aren't we, Dilly? Now, here, here is a fungus. And uh, zucchini, like this zucchini here, and tomatoes here, and grass, they're plants. So animals and fungi and plants are what's called eukaryotes. Eu means have, and carry means nucleus. They have a nucleus. But bacteria in archaea are prokaryotes. Now, eukaryotes have their DNA, here's the DNA, wrapped up in a nuclear membrane like that. And prokaryotes, like bacteria and archaea, have no nuclear membrane. And they're very small. Well, how small are they? Well, here's a needle and thread. And I'm looking at the end of this needle, and I don't see any bacteria. But let's have a more careful look. Here is the eye of a needle with a thread going through it. And at the other end of the needle, we have a very sharp tip with bacteria. And bacteria are prokaryotes. They are not eukaryotes. And we're going to be talking about eukaryotes today. Now, if we were if a eukaryote would be about this size, prokaryotes are about that size. So let's talk about phylogenetic trees to help us understand what is a eukaryote. Here's a tree of all life. Here are the multicellular eukaryotes, fungus and people, animals and plants. And here in green are all of the eukaryotes. Here are the prokaryotes. Now, it's said, it has been said that the prokaryote-eukaryote divide, that's this black line, is the greatest single evolutionary discontinuity to be found in the present day world. This is a statement from 1963. But recently, we've taken a closer look at where the eukaryotes branch from the prokaryotes, and that's this root that we've put here is wrong. It should be somewhere over there in the blue. So we've got to take all the eukaryotes and re-embed them into the archaea, something like that. Now that's a revolutionizing of this phylogenetic tree, and that's typical of the type of things that are going on at the roots of these trees. We don't know the roots very well. But we're getting there. So what we can say is that the eukaryotes evolved from the archaea, or we can say that the eukaryotes are a kind of archaea. When I say that, I have a few qualms because eukaryotes are not just archaea. As can be seen in this diagram, the eukaryotes also have a bacterial component. Some people think, oh, it's a mixture of bacteria and archaea. But uh, it, you could also say, no, it's dominated by uh, the archaeal component. Now this is something we're used to because we've talked about how jawed fish, fishes with jaws, have evolved from jawless fish. And so we say that jawed fish evolved from jawless fish. Jawed fish are a kind of jawless fish. In other words, a jaw had to evolve from something that didn't have a jaw. Now, what about this transition from eukaryotes, from prokaryotes to eukaryotes? There's a nice book. The Major Transitions in Evolution, published in 1995. It's a very important book, very influential. Here are the people who wrote it. And they said, the transition from prokaryotes to eukaryotes is one of the eight major transitions in evolution. Major transitions is what this book is about. Here's another book, What Evolution Is, by Ernst Mayer. And here's Ernst. He said, the evolution of cells with nuclei, those are eukaryotes, is perhaps the most important and dramatic event in the history of life. Here's another book, Life Ascending, The Ten Great Inventions of Evolution by Nick Lane, published in 2009. And here's Nick, Nick Lane, and he's, he wrote the book Ten Great Inventions. Well, the fourth great invention of evolution was the complex cell. In other words, a eukaryotic cell. He also wrote that the gulf between bacteria and everything else is a matter of organization at the level of cells. Another book, The Ancestor's Tale. This is a revised version. I recommend it highly. Written by these two guys, Richard Dawkins and Yan Wang. 
And Richard, notice he has We Are All African t-shirts, and this is true, we are all African, we're also fish. <laughs> and they wrote, arguably the most decisive event in the history of life, the origin of the eukaryotic cell, the high-tech miniature machine that is the micro-foundation of all large-scale and complex life on this planet. So if this transition from prokaryote to eukaryote is so important, we can ask, will ETs be eukaryotes? Many people think that life will start out very simple, i.e. prokaryotic elsewhere. That's not, supposedly not that hard. But then you ask the question, will they evolve into you, to eukaryotes? If ETs start out as prokaryotes, do they evolve into eukaryotes? If we can find out more about this transition on Earth, maybe we can make a guess at answering this question. So here's a eukaryotic cell. And the prokaryotic cell inside of it is the green blob. And another prokaryotic cell is about the size of that blob. So you can see that a eukaryotic cell contains many, many prokaryotic cells. The biggest difference between a prokaryote on the left and a eukaryote on the right is the size. This is about the actual size differences between the two. And uh, the, in fact, the mitochondrion in blue here is labeled and that is about the size of the prokaryote on the left because the mitochondrion used to be a free-living prokaryote. So let's zoom in on the prokaryote and see what's inside of it. And there you go, you have ribosomes in both of them. And I'm pointing this out because ribosomes are what is used to connect in a phylogenetic tree prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Here's another version of prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Um, the one on the right, the eukaryotes, are called eu, means having, and carry means nucleus. So there's a nuclear membrane around the DNA in eukaryotes. And let's exaggerate that a little bit so you can see, make it obvious. Also, eukaryotes have mitochondria, and some single-celled eukaryotes have plastids. Both mitochondria and plastids used to be free-living prokaryotes. So the, red blo the brown blobs and the green blobs should be about the same size as the blob on the left, the prokaryote. The tree of life. Here's a billion years of animal evolution from the tip of the red to the tip of the blue. Eukaryotes are much older than a billion years, therefore animals evolved for a billion years. Eukaryotes are much older. They've evolved for longer, maybe three billion years of eukaryotic evolution from the tip of the green arrow to the tip of the blue arrow. Now, Let's have a closer look at some images of some of these eukaryotic cousins that we have. So we've seen the fungi, the animals, and the plants. And you can see connected in this diagram are Cryptomonas, Aquila, Costeria, Porifera, Paramecium, Babesia, and Dictostillum. Let's have a look at what they look like. So here are the ones that we're familiar with. They're macroscopic. And then here's Cryptomonas. That's microscopic. You can see 10 microns. And then there's Aquila, a filamentous bacterium. Then we have larger things, Costaria and Porifera. Simple cells, but they're multicellular and quite large. Then we have Dictostillum, a slime mold. And then we have Paramecium and Euglena, single-celled things with all kinds of interesting, smaller, pro formerly prokaryotic cells inside them. And then we have Babesia, kind of an intercellular parasite. So the range, variety of sizes of eukaryotes is enormous. Enormous. Let's have some more photographs to get a feeling for what we're talking about. Here are plants up on the top, and then there are pistachons. Now, we should remember the word apistachons because we are an apistachont. We are represented here by jellyfish. It's an animal. And there's a fungi. It's also an apistachont. And then there's a group called amoeba. That's a few what they look like. And then there's an interesting group called excavata. They're interesting because they may be the root of the eukaryotes. So that's our kind, that's a photographic tour of eukaryotes. Let's look at a phylogenetic pie chart. Here it is. It's got many, many, all the eukaryotes that uh, we know about here from a wonderful paper by Berkey at 2014. And where are humans? Where are humans? Humans are right there. The bilateria, that's where starfish, that's where all fish are. That's where flies are. Next to it, you can see porfer, porifera, the sponges. And Interior to that, you can see animals, and animals are connected to fungi, and those two together make the apistachons. That's our wonderful group. We are apistachons. Here are the plants. Here are the amoeba. 
Notice they're the sister group of the Episticons. Then there are the excavates, and then there's a group called the SAR, a very large group made up of stromidopiles, the alveolates, and the rosaria. And there are lots of those. And then the apusozoa, in between the amoebas and the um, apisticons. And then there are a bunch of others we're not quite sure, so we put a question mark there. Now, this is a phylogenetic tree, but we're not quite sure where the root is. And to make a good tree, you need to know where the root is. And maybe the root is there. Or all these little arrows show possible positions of the roots. Maybe it's here or here or here or here. But there's also one, look at that, it, maybe the root is right there. We're not quite sure where the root is. And to make this in terms of time, you need to know where the root is. So let's consider a root at maybe A or maybe B. Let's uh, clean up this diagram a little bit. And we need some acronyms. So, diaphorictes, D-I-A, are this large group, more than half, this, this gray arc comprising more than half of what you're looking at here. Then there's the excavates there, and the episticons are in blue, the amoebas are in yellow. And if we have a tree with a root at A, this is what it looks like. Basically, you start out as an animal, and you say, if I'm an episticont, and then you're on your way to A, and then you meet the diaphorictes and the excavates at the red dot, which is right there, and then you meet A, you meet the amoebas. That's how you make a phylogenetic tree, following from where you're interested in to where you're going to the root. What about if the root is at B? Well, this is the tree. You start out at the episticons, you're on your way to B, then you meet up the amoebas, and then you meet up the diaphorictes, um, at the red dot, and the red dot is right there, and then at the bottom you meet the excavates at B. Here's another example of that same tree, and just for indication, a schematic indication of the time available, we have a common ancestor with fungi about 1.2 billion years, maybe a pusozoa another 100 million years earlier, maybe amoebas 1.4 and 1.6 there with the plants, and maybe excavates too. These are very rough dates. They could be off by 20% or so. But no matter where the root is, at A or B or anywhere else, it seems that eukaryotes evolved from archaea. So we can say that eukaryotes are a kind of archaea. But if we knew that the root was at B, then we could say that the eukaryotes evolved from an excavata-like organism, and we could say that eukaryotes are a kind of excavata. So, animals and fungi and plants, all this multicellular eukaryotic diversity evolved from preceding unicellular eukaryotic diversity. And all that diversity evolved, we think, from something called excavates. Now, it's easy for us to imagine extraterrestrial animals we do it all the time, yes. <laughs> but how easy is it to imagine extraterrestrial excavates? How likely are those guys? Billy? Billy, how likely are those? 